Diabetes Mellitus, Chapter 49 from the Lewis Textbook, A Review from Class. Diabetic ketoacidosis is caused by a profound deficiency of insulin and is characterized by hyperglycemia, ketosis, acidosis, and dehydration. It is most likely to occur in people with type 1 diabetes, but may be seen in people with type 2 diabetes in conditions of severe illness or stress when the pancreas cannot meet the extra demand for insulin. Precipitating factors include illness and infection, inadequate insulin dosage, undiagnosed type 1 diabetes, poor self-management, and neglect. When the circulating supply of insulin is insufficient, glucose cannot be properly used for energy, and the body compensates by breaking down fat stores as a secondary source of fuel. Ketones are acidic byproducts of fat metabolism that can cause serious problems when they become excessive in the blood. Ketosis alters the pH balance, causing metabolic acidosis to develop. Ketonuria, now that's a process that occurs when the ketone bodies are excreted in the urine. Insulin deficiency impairs protein synthesis and causes excessive protein degradation. This results in nitrogen losses from the tissue. Insulin deficiency also stimulates the production of glucose from amino acids from proteins in the liver and leads to further hyperglycemia. Because there is a deficiency of insulin, the additional glucose cannot be used, and the blood glucose level rises further, adding to the osmotic diuresis. If not treated, the patient will develop severe depletion of sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, and phosphate. Vomiting caused by acidosis results in more fluid and electrolyte losses. Eventually, the patient could get hypovolemic and then followed by shock. Renal failure, which may eventually occur from hypovolemic shock, causes the retention of ketones and glucose and the acidosis progresses. Untreated, the patient becomes comatose as a result of dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, and acidosis. If not treated, death is inevitable. Dehydration occurs in diabetic ketoacidosis with symptoms of poor skin turgor, dry mucous membranes, tachycardia, and orthostatic hypotension. Early symptoms may include lethargy and weakness. As the patient becomes severely dehydrated, the skin becomes dry and loose and the eyes become soft and sunken. Abdominal pain may be present and accompanied by anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. Kuzmal's respirations, rapid deep breathing associated with dyspnea, are the body's attempt to reverse metabolic acidosis through the exhalation of excess carbon dioxide. Acetone is noted on the breath as a sweet, fruity odor. Lab findings would include a blood glucose level of 250 or higher, arterial pH less than 7.3, serum bicarbonate level less than 16, and moderate to high ketone levels in the urine or serum. Patients with DKA may require hospitalization for treatment. However, when fluid and electrolyte imbalances are not severe and blood glucose levels can be safely monitored at home, less severe forms of DKA may be managed on an outpatient basis. Patients with DKA who have illnesses such as pneumonia or urinary tract infection are usually admitted to the hospital. Other factors that would be considered is if whether or not they have fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, altered mental status, and what caused the ketoacidosis. DKA is a serious condition that must be treated promptly. Make sure there is a patent airway and administer oxygen via nasal cannula or non-rebreather mask. Because fluid imbalance is potentially life-threatening, the initial goal of therapy is to establish IV access and begin fluid and electrolyte replacement. Typically, the initial fluid regimen consists of an infusion of 0.45% or 0.9% sodium chloride at a rate to restore urine output to 30 to 60 mL an hour and to raise the blood pressure. When blood glucose levels approach 250, then 5 to 10% dextrose is added to the fluid regimen to prevent hypoglycemia as well as a sudden drop in glucose that can be associated with cerebral edema. Overzealous rehydration, especially with a hypotonic IV solution, can result in cerebral edema. The patient should be monitored with renal or cardiac compromise for fluid overload. Measure serum potassium levels before starting insulin. If the patient is hypokalemic, insulin administration will further decrease the potassium levels, which makes early potassium replacement essential. Although initial serum potassium value may be normal or high, Levels can decrease rapidly once therapy starts as insulin drives potassium into the cell leading to life-threatening hypokalemia. 
IV insulin administration is therapy directed toward correcting hyperglycemia and hyperketonemia. Insulin is immediately started at 0.1 units per kilogram per hour by continuous infusion, and it's important to prevent rapid drops in serum glucose to avoid cerebral edema. Insulin allows water and potassium to enter the cell along with glucose and can lead to a depletion of vascular volume and hypokalemia, so it's important for the nurse to monitor the fluid balance and potassium levels. Hyperosmolar Hyperglycemic Syndrome This is a life-threatening syndrome that can occur in a patient with diabetes who is able to produce enough insulin to prevent DKA, but not enough to prevent severe hyperglycemia, osmotic diuresis, and extracellular fluid depletion. Hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome is less common than diabetic ketoacidosis, and it often occurs in patients older than 60 years with type 2 diabetes. The common causes are urinary tract infections, pneumonia, sepsis, any acute illness, and newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. It is often related to impaired thirst sensation and or a functional inability to replace fluids. There is usually a history of inadequate fluid intake, increasing mental depression, and polyuria. The main difference between HHS and DKA is that the patient with HHS usually has enough circulating insulin so that ketoacidosis does not occur. Because HHS produces fewer symptoms in the earlier stages, blood glucose levels can climb quite high before the problem is recognized. The higher blood glucose levels increase serum osmolality and produce more severe neurological symptoms such as somnolence, coma, seizures, hemiparesis, and aphasia. Because these symptoms resemble a stroke, immediate determination of the glucose level is critical for correct diagnosis and treatment. Lab values in HHS include a blood glucose greater than 600 and a marked increase in serum osmolality. Ketone bodies are absent or minimal in both blood and urine. HHS constitutes a medical emergency and has a higher mortality rate. The management of DKA and of HHS are similar and include immediate IV administration of insulin and either 0.9% or 0.45% of sodium chloride. HHS usually needs greater volumes of fluid replacement, but this should be accomplished slowly and carefully. Patients with HHS are commonly older and may have cardiac or renal compromise, which means hemodynamic monitoring might be needed to avoid fluid overload during fluid replacement. When blood glucose levels fall to approximately 250, IV fluids containing glucose are given to prevent hypoglycemia. Electrolytes are monitored and replaced as needed. Hypokalemia is not as significant in HHS as it is in DKA, although fluid losses may result in milder potassium deficits that do require replacement. Assess vital signs, eyes and nose, tissue turgor, lab values, and cardiac monitoring to check the efficacy of fluid and electrolyte replacements. This includes monitoring of serum osmolality and frequent assessment of cardiac, renal, and mental status. Once the patient is stabilized, Attempts to detect and correct the underlying precipitating cause should be initiated. Closely monitoring blood glucose and urine for output in ketones as well as laboratory data to determine the appropriate patient care. Monitor the administration of the IV fluids to correct dehydration, insulin therapy to reduce blood glucose and serum acetone levels, and electrolytes given to correct the electrolyte imbalance. Assess the renal status and the cardiopulmonary status related to hydration and electrolyte levels monitor the levels of consciousness, and assess the signs for potassium imbalance resulting from hypoinsulinemia and osmotic diuresis. When treatment with insulin begins, serum potassium levels may decrease rapidly as the potassium moves into the cell once insulin becomes available. This movement of potassium into and out of extracellular fluid influences cardiac functioning. Cardiac monitoring is a useful aid in detecting hyperkalemia and hypokalemia because characteristic changes indicating potassium excess or deficit are observable on the ECG tracing. Assessed vital signs is often used to determine the presence of fever, hypovolemic shock, tachycardia, and Kuzmal's respirations.